officials going around the world. But God does call us to, to go reach Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts. And if you're around here long enough, it, it's very possible that the Lord will convict your heart. And you know what? Uh, to get from, from here to there, it starts with that little skit that you saw just now. It's that daily battle with the flesh. It's that reckoning uh, with who you are in Christ versus who your old flesh says you are and allowing Christ to overcome that, uh, feeding your, your uh, spirit through the word of God. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that here in just a minute, but I want to give you just a quick update. So how's that battle going? So far, it's going incredible in Mumbai. Be praying for our brothers over there. Uh, I got an update from Doug. I got an update from um, <clears throat> Randy, and I also had, you guys have been seeing those updates from Chris Chiadini. Uh, who may be the new Doug Pearson, man, with the way he's writing those updates. So uh, very good stuff. Uh, I heard Kyle Peebler was out going through the slums preaching. Uh, uh, incredible. What growth have we seen, right? And, uh, uh, I mean, not just a little preaching. Uh, Doug told me he took off on his own. They were worried about him being shy, and next thing you know, he's off just going to town. So uh, a lot of growth going on in the team. I heard that they are walking uh, slum to slum. I heard a story of Brad McGuire um, just the, the families are just riveted as he goes in and he literally, I guess, squats down in the huts in, in, the, in the slums with them. And as he's preaching, they just seem to respond to him. And so incredible. He had 30 people around him at the beach uh, yesterday listening to him preach the gospel. Uh, Chris Chiadini also, I, I heard he had a, quite a group around him as well as these guys were just running into English-speaking Indians. So there was no translator necessary. And they wanted to know, what are these Americans doing here? And so they told him, and they told him we're here because Jesus brought us here. Uh, incredible what God does when we just yield ourselves to him. <clears throat> but there is that adversary, right? There's, there's the devil, but also there's our, our flesh. And so it is awesome. We should praise the Lord, thank God for his victory. We need to, by the way, I want you to pray uh, for these guys, but also pray for their wives and their children. Uh, Deanne McKittrick was uh, ill this week, so keep her in prayer. as She's uh, wrestling with some sickness while her husband's away, and... Uh, those, are, those are real battles, and we like to be focused on those real battles. And we want to all be engaged in those things. We need to pray for those things. We need to see God faithful through those things. But you know what? We've got to go back to that illustration. It starts right there, doesn't it? It's that daily, uh, that daily discipline, that choice that we make to follow uh, the Spirit and not yield to the temptation of the flesh. And it's a battle that we're all engaged in. Uh, and frankly, unless you have the Spirit of God in you, you're still bound on this side, in that illustration, in chains. It's only the Lord Jesus Christ, the Word of God. It is only Jesus Christ himself that can set you free from that. And so this morning as we come together, we're studying the book of Romans because the doctrine, the things that we need, the teaching that we need from the Lord to build our life in a way that will last. And I'm not just talking about in this life, but eternal life fruit that remains we talk about fruit that remains we're not talking about uh you know 20 years or 70 years we're talking about an internal impact and if you're if you're saved you have in you already a natural desire a supernatural desire a hunger for fruit you you hunger to have fellowship with god you hunger to know god's word and you hunger to to have a, an impact that is more than just the day-to-day -day grind you want to make sure that your life impacts eternity uh, and so we're endeavoring to do that by what? Following God's will, following God's word, and, and winning that battle. The cool thing that we're going to see this morning is that the battle really is won. It really has been won. If you look in, in uh, this uh, book of Romans chapter 8, I call this the powerhouse. Uh, this is really a powerful, it's one of the more powerful chapters in the book of Romans, and it's a very encouraging word that we're going to see this morning, especially as we begin the first verse. And I just want you to look at Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. The Bible says here in Romans 8 and verse 1, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. And I just want to pause at that, that comma. There, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. What an incredible thing. No No condemnation. When I think of that word condemnation, it's a powerful word. What is it like to be condemned, right? Condemned. Condemned. There are people that are, uh, maybe even in this room today, condemned. When a house is condemned, what is it useful for? It's fitted for destruction, right? When you condemn a house, it is no longer inhabitable. You see, that's where we are. That's where we would be. Without the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, 
this house, this tabernacle, would not be inhabitable by a holy God. Romans 8 focuses on the power of God's Spirit. God's Spirit overcomes that condemnation. God's Spirit will bring in and through us a transformation. And also, as we get to the end of Romans chapter 8, we're going to see that the the Spirit of God gives us a confirmation, a, a, a comfort that comes in knowing His sufficiency in us, through us, working for us. It's an incredible power that God has unleashed through the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. You, if you're born again, have you, there is no condemnation. You have gone from a place where you were fitted for destruction. You are not you. You because of sin. We've already looked at those uh, chapters and those verses. We understand that because of the wages of sin is death. We are fitted for destruction. Yet, while we were yet sinners, right? Christ died for us. And he's going to do a renovation. He's going to do a renovation. And that comes through the indwelling, and we'll talk about this as we get into the text, the indwelling of the Spirit, the indwelling of the Spirit of God. So, so Paul is building off of what he sees. This is a very powerful concept. As I, as I was reading this chapter many years ago, uh, I, really, I really was just, I can, remember, I can remember coming up through Romans chapter uh, 6 and 7 and, and getting to Romans chapter 8, feeling just like Paul. And as you remember, chapter 7 last week, we were, uh, Paul asked the question, O wretched man that I am, I'm condemned. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. And Paul clearly laid out that paradox between the flesh, which thinks it's alive, right? Which is really, positionally, it's already been crucified. It's already been nailed to the cross 2,000 years ago. And the spirit. And these two are contrary, right? One to another. So you cannot do the things that you would, Galatians says. And there's this war. And the Apostle Paul himself, in this epistle, gets very personal as he approaches chapter 7. And he opens up his heart and he begins to share his own struggles. And I'm so glad he did because you know what? There had no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. We all wrestle with our flesh. And when you're born again, you're tempted to believe the lies of the devil. We talked about that last week, how the, le- the devil will con- begin to, to deceive you. You'll begin to believe that, you know what, you are your flesh. You do want that cereal, and that's who you really are. But that isn't who you are. Not anymore if you're saved. You are a son of God. First John chapter 3 is very clear. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. We are his children. That is who you really are if you're born again. Now, if you have your text, look here in verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Now, after this comma, it starts to get dicey. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death, For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace." Because the carnal mind is enmity, it's at war against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. If we stopped right there this morning, you might feel like you're in jeopardy, even as a Christian. But as you enter verse 9, the grace of God just, just, just envelops us as it says, But ye are not in the flesh. Wait a minute. I think I am. No, ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, 
He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. You getting the message? Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if you through the, uh, through the spirit do mortify, kill the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Heavenly Father, as we come to your throne this morning, we approach you understanding that you are holy, holy, holy. As the universe is in your hands, you're in control. You have loved us. You have seen our sin before we even realized it and recognized it. And you have provided a way to escape. Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus Christ, the sacrificial lamb, the lamb of God that has taken away the sin of the world. Thank you for bringing to our understanding our need to turn from sin to Christ, to, to acknowledge our, our wickedness, our condemnation, and turn to the one who has the power to overcome. Thank you for changing who we are and transforming us into the sons of God, to the children of God. Heavenly Father, I pray this morning as we look into this passage that you would quicken it, that you would minister to each and every heart the words that need to be said, Lord, that you would get the increase, that you would be glorified. Lord, that we would see the victory for your sake, for your kingdom. We thank you and we praise you and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. No condemnation. No condemnation. Paul is building here off of what we learned last week. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank Jesus Christ, right? I thank Jesus Christ, our Lord, so then with the mind, this is a subject matter that we're going to look into, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. There's a struggle. There's a struggle. And so we have to know that there is therefore now, right now, no condemnation to them, to them which are in Christ Jesus. Now, when I look at that concept, I think at Romans chapter 8 and this answer to Romans chapter 7 is incredible. How wretched we are with the sinful flesh. How can God ever, ever find us acceptable? I mean, you don't take a shower for a day and you start to smell. You know, you go out and you work a little. I mean, our bodies are just, they're just decaying. They're getting, they're, they're, as you get older, it breaks down. I mean, right, the, the body is just, how could God find this acceptable? And the longer you're saved, the more you seek God, the more you really realize, man, in my flesh, as Paul said in chapter 7, dwelleth what? No good thing. I think when we're younger, sometimes we deceive ourselves when we're in our prime of life, right? Six pack, mm, there's something good. No, it isn't. That's going to fade, man. That's going to fade. Believe me. That's right. Some of you men can say Amen. I did have a six-pack once, didn't I? Once. She smiles. <laughs> All right. And it wasn't beer. Okay. It's getting carnal already, see? All right. But Paul said in chapter 7 and verse 24 that he was wretched. In Romans 8, 1, there's therefore now no condemnation. We understand that. But the key word that I want you to see there is, is after the comma. Who, who walk not after the flesh, but after the, the Spirit. You're going to see this Spirit, capital S, the personal pronoun, the very person of Christ, the invisible person of God, Christ Jesus, in us. The Spirit, the Holy Ghost, is in us. When you accept Christ, you are born again by the Spirit. John chapter 3, right? The Spirit of God indwells our bodies. As we got past chapter, or verse 9, 10, 11, uh, four or five times there, in you. In you, in you, Christ is in us, and we are in him. There is a conflict between the flesh and the spirit. It's a tremendous answer of grace to the believer in Christ. Paul will systematically show us why there is no condemnation as we work up through verse 13. So there's a temptation uh, to read this and say, yeah, but, uh, but I don't always walk in the spirit, so therefore I am condemned. 
Anyone ever read Romans 8 like that? I have. The first few times through it, I, 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 that's how I finally got so excited about verse 9. Because like Paul, as you go through that, that thing in your flesh and your spirit, and if you don't read it all the way through, you're, you might get stuck midway and feel like you are condemned. But the, the good news is you're not condemned if you're born again. Now, there is a sense in which we do walk and wrestle with the spirit and the flesh, just like the, the skit that we just saw. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16. Now, just flip over there with me real quick. As we live this out in our day-to-day walk, this has ministered to me in a, in a mighty way over the years. And I've shared this before, but I'll share it again. There was a time especially in my younger uh, walk with the Lord, I would be so swallowed up with condemnation, self-condemnation. Um, and, and I would always quote this verse, man. I'm like, God, I need to walk in the Spirit. I need to walk in the Spirit. What in the world is wrong? I hate my flesh, you know. And, and, uh, and I, you know, that's good. You, you don't need to be friends with your flesh. It's at war with God, you know. Uh, but it is useful. You have to, you're chained to it until you get your new body. Galatians 5.16 says, uh, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now, something happened to me in my theological training when I was a young Christian. For some reason, when I read that verse, it didn't say, uh, uh, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. In my mind, for whatever reason, uh, it said, walk in the Spirit, and you will never be tempted by your flesh. Anybody ever... See it like that? And so, man, then you start, man, you're trying to bring every thought captive. You're dealing with all. And I tell you what, it gets worse. And you start to think, oh, wretched man that I am. Who can deliver me from the? And then finally one day I'm reading this thing. And, and I read it again and it says, this I say then, walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And the spirit of God spoke to my heart and said, you know, Brian, the rest of your life, your flesh will lust. The issue is not to focus on the flesh. The issue is to focus on the spirit. Because if you focus on me, guess what? You will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. But until if you got skin on, I'm telling you, you're in for a long battle. And I don't want to call names, but you could grab a couple of our older saints in the house, right? And I bet they could tell you and testify, listen, and I don't know how it goes, but I, even when, before, you, as long as you got skin on, there's going to be struggles with the flesh. It's going to want what it wants, and your spiritual man's going to want what it wants. And there's going to be a conflict. So then, we must walk in the Spirit. Now, as you go on down here, it says in verse 17, for the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. Look at that. Look what it says. The flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. They're at odds with one another. And these are contrary one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. you got a mini micro Romans 7 right here in a few verses. As he's writing to those who knew the law, those Galatians, those Judaizers. He's like, hey guys, you need to walk in the spirit. There's a conflict. But if you be led of the spirit, you're not under the... The law. Remember, we talked about that last week. The law. More than just the law of Moses, right? There's, law of the, there's the law of sin and death. Uh, we talked, pointed out several of those. So, I bring that up because there is a choice. That's what you see in verse 16. Walk in the Spirit. Why? Because there's a choice. Verses 17 through 18, there's a, a war. And then, of course, look at verse 25. If we live in the Spirit... Let us also walk in the Spirit. We have no life outside of Christ. And because we have no life outside of Christ, let us therefore walk in the Spirit. Now go back with me to Romans chapter 8. The very same words are being used here in verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk, not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. The reality of the power of God's Spirit in us causes us to walk differently. There's no doubt about that. Now, Paul is driving us through these verses, and he's going to get us to Romans chapter 8 and verse 9. 
where it says, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. You either have him or you don't. Either you are in Christ or you're not. So if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Not our righteousness, but the righteousness of Christ. So the victor of the, uh, over the law of sin is, is not your mind, but the Holy Spirit that dwells in you. Jesus Christ has already won the victory 2,000 years ago. The victor, the one who knows how to conquer sin. Yes, check this out. The champion, right here. He's inside of you, not me personally. Okay, I'm talking about the invisible man of Christ. If you're born again, the man, the man, the only man who's ever conquered sin, check this out, secret weapon, lives in you. Amen, praise the Lord. He dwells in you. He dwells in you. That's why you want to spend time communion with him, because he knows how to walk the walk. He knows how to talk the talk, right? Now, we often cover up the talk with the other churchy talk, but no, I'm talking about he knows how to, he knows how, not because he knows how, because he is right. He is the righteousness of God. He's at the right hand of the Father, right? So, so Jesus Christ is righteous, and because he's righteous, you're righteous. It's been imputed to you. We've talked about that in previous chapters. You are a victor because Jesus Christ was victorious. And now the invisible person of God, Christ, is in you. The Spirit of God. He's dwelling in you. So there is no condemnation because the Spirit of life in Christ has freed us from the law of sin and death. That's what it says in verse 2. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Hallelujah. I'm free. I'm free. You saw those chains come off. Paul is still very personal here. See, this isn't, he's not talking about y'all. He's talking about himself. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ hath made who? Me. Free. Made me free. Paul writing to, by the way, a lot of slaves in Rome. There's a lot of people he's addressing here that are in literal bondage. They don't have their own way. They don't have their own life. They, every day their life is ordered by somebody else. You know, some of y'all feel that way, don't you? Maybe it's the burden of debt. It's the burden of work. It's the burden of this. It's the burden of that. You have no liberty. But listen, let me tell you something. If you're born again, you're a free man, even if your life is not your own. Paul was a man who was not going to be free to do everything he wanted in the flesh, but everything that he did, even going to jail, guess what it did? It prospered because the victor was in him. Even Nero could take him out and chop his head off, which is exactly what's going to happen to Paul. And you know what? You can't stop Paul because he's going to resurrect. Not even death will stop us. Why? Because Jesus Christ is in us. It's incredible. The Holy Spirit of God. And so we're free, he says in verse 2. It made us free from the law of sin and death. You don't have to serve that, but sometimes we choose to. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ hath made me, now look at this, hath, past tense, made me free from the law. It wasn't not, present, not just present tense, past tense. Tense. It's already happened. So this is simple. Paul is in the first person, and he's answering complaints of Romans 7, and he's already been made, past tense, free, through the work of Christ on the cross for his sins. Now, Paul told the Galatians, how are you going to finish in the flesh what God began in the, in the Spirit, in Galatians 3 and verse 3? Are you guys so foolish that you're going to think that you're going you're to come to a place of repentance, you're going to bow down on the floor, and you're going to say, Jesus Christ, come into my heart and save me. I am, I, I, without you, I am nothing. I need Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And you come to that point of contrition and brokenness and you say, Jesus, I need you to, 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 to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. And without you, I, I have no hope of life. And you come to that point and you trust him for eternity. And then for some reason, we turn around and we say, now, just like that skit, I can take it from here. Thanks. As if we're going to do a better job of living day to day. We can't get ourselves out of trouble. You just can't. You know, as people say, um, you know, how are you doing? Well, I, I know how to get into trouble, but I don't know how to get out. That is the truth. You know what? In our flesh, we know how to get into all kinds of trouble. But you can't find your way to get out. And we get to the point, we wait till it's the worst possible scenario. Our back's against the wall. You know, we're all pinned up here. 
Oh, Jesus, save me, save me. And you feel that freedom. Woo! And then something just comes over you. It's called your flesh. And you start to believe that, you know what? I got it from here. Thanks for fixing me. Hey, listen, you're deceiving yourself. You're deceiving yourself. Winning the reality of Christ's victory over the flesh must happen in the mind before you can experience the peace in your body because your body is going to fight you all the way. Paul mentioned in Romans 7.23 the battle between the law of the mind and the law of sin that is in our members when he said, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind, bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. We get so focused on our members, on our body parts, on all the, the outward things that we forget the real problem was the, the battle was lost in the mind. That's where the battle, where did Satan take the battle? To Eve. Well, he used physical things to entice her, but it was in the mind. He got her to beguiled. He got her to believe that what God said was not really true. I need thee every hour. Well, not really. I just need you in the morning and the evening. But in between there, I can take it on my own. No, we need him every hour. You say, but I feel pretty good today. Well, don't be, be careful. That'll get you in trouble. How many of you have ever been feeling pretty good and 20 seconds later you're in the sin? Amen. Don't trust yourself. Don't trust yourself. Trust the word of God. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Prove your life out by the word. Now, there's a problem there because when you're young in the Lord, you really don't have, you don't know. You're going on your emotions a lot of times. You're going on your feelings. You're going on what I tell you. You're on someone else you respect tells you. And see, this is the thing. Paul addresses this right here in the next few verses. The issue is the battle that goes on for the mind. You've got to have your mind renewed. You must have your mind renewed. Paul mentions in this verse that the sin, uh, the sin brings his mind, in particular, the law of his mind, captive to the law of sin and death. This is where the war rages. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 10. Now turn over there, 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5. He talks about this to the Corinthians because they were noted for having carnal minds. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Check this out. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, i got to get moving here. 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 1. Now I, Paul, myself beseech you by the meekness and the gentleness of Christ, who in presence am base among you, but being absent and bold towards you, I beseech you, meaning, he, that means it's not a command, but I strongly encourage you, that I may uh, not be bold when I am present with uh, the confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some which think of us as, we, as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they're not fleshly, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down what? Imaginations, images, and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every, here it comes, thought. To the obedience of Christ. Captivity. And having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when, our obe- when your obedience is fulfilled. This passage is the summation of what Paul is setting forth in Romans 7 and 8. The carnal man is death, but the spiritual man, through Christ Jesus and his indwelling Holy Ghost, has overcome the law of flesh, giving us what I call a re-roll. It's a re-roll. Now, when I, I, once upon a time in a former life, I actually used to wrestle. And in wrestling, there, there's, a, there's a process you go through. When someone is, is, is uh, going to take you down or throw you, um, there's a point where you can no longer resist it. And so uh, you're going to go. You press too hard, they're pulling too fast, boom, you're going down. Now, the cool thing about this is it, it, if you have your, your head on straight, right, uh, what you do is you immediately go to what's called a re-roll. And so when you hit the ground, you just go ahead and use their power and their strength against you, and you just keep rolling with it so that you can end up on top in the dominant position. And you then pin them instead of them pinning you. And so it's a re-roll. Now what happens with Christ is, is our flesh thinks that it has us. It thinks that it has you. I mean, it, it even and you feel that way. Your, your mind, you just feel like, oh man, I can't resist. And you get thrown. You get dominated. 
But I got news for you, beloved. Inside of you is the champion. Inside of you is the Spirit of God. Inside of you is Christ Jesus. And he knows how to utilize your own, your own weakness against, against itself so that you can come out on top. In your favor, you counter with your own strength. And the result is your opponent, which had you tied up in the submission, uh, is in turn neutralized and overpowered by his own inertia. Now this is like our flesh, desiring to bring us into captivity, the law of sin and death, and we're tied up in the mind. When the motions of sin are released in your life, Romans chapter 7 and verse 5, to bring you into captivity and condemnation, you, are, you have met your match. You've met with much greater force. But when Jesus Christ comes into play, when the word of God is set in motion, there is a force that is let, let loose in our life that gives us a supernatural ability to overcome the flesh. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus therefore makes us free from the law of sin and death because the spirit of God is truly an unstoppable force. Now, he is unbeatable. He is victorious. So when Jesus met with the Pharisees and discussed the deity, what did they do? They denied it. Turn back over to John chapter 8 with me. John chapter 8. He was in a great spiritual war, a wrestling match of words and of the mind. John chapter 8. Look down here in verse, uh, verse 31. As he speaks to the Pharisees, it says, Then said Jesus to the Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then ye are my disciples indeed. You can, you're you're going to be indeed um, what I have been speaking of. And ye shall know the truth and look at this. And the truth shall make you free. The truth will make you free. Praise the Lord. You're liberated because of the truth. Now the Jews who were listening, they answered him. These aren't the ones that were following him. We be Abraham's seed and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me, because, listen, my word hath no place in you. Beloved, if you want to be free, the only way to be free is to have Jesus Christ in you. He is the Word of God. When we receive Jesus Christ, we're, that's saying something. The Word of God dwells in us, the Bible says, richly. Why? Because we are free positionally, but also day to day, we remind our flesh that, listen, you are dead, you are buried, and Jesus Christ is on the throne, just like the, the image that we saw. There is a literal battle for the mind. Jesus goes on in the same passage and, and they, it says in verse 39, They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, If ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. But now ye seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. You do the deeds of your father, the murderer. Then said they to him, We be not born of fornication. The backhanded uh, stab at Jesus. We have one father, even God. And Jesus said, it, said unto them, If ye... If God were your father, ye would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Verse 43. Why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word. They had a problem with Jesus' word. The word was not setting in on their mind. They were losing the battle, and there was a big battle at play. God was trying to come to his own. His own would not receive him because why? They wouldn't receive his word. There are people that are locked down in sin. They're locked down, even Christians, born-again Christians, locked down. They're pinned on the ground. They act like they're stuck. And there is no reason in the world why they can't get up other than the fact that they will not obey the Word of God. That's how you got saved. Guess what? That's how you get freed. That's how you got saved. That's how you get freed is the Word of God. And so we run around and we spend 30 minutes in church on Sunday and we catch a devotional on the radio one day and then we wonder, why, why am I struggling with my flesh? Why does my flesh convince me that it's in control? Why do I feel like I'm an addict to meth instead of an addict to ministry? Well, it's, this is why. Because you're not feeding the Spirit. You're not setting your... You, you, listen, it's all right here in the Word of God. 
Feed the spiritual man, not the fleshly man. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4 with me. I, I, beloved, I just got to tell you, there's a war. There is a war going on, and it's manifest all around us. It's in this room. It's in this sermon. There is a, a war on, and, and when you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, you see what's happening here. Well, let's start in verse 1. He says, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, the ministry of reconciliation, we, uh, as we have received mercy, not desert, getting what we deserve, we faint not. We faint not. Why? Because it's difficult at times. But, but what have we done? We have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. We're open and exposed. That's what Paul's being in Romans 7 and Romans 8. Verse 3. But if our gospel be hid, our good news be hid, it is hid to him, who? Those that are lost. In that, in that Jared skit over here, Jared's flesh, Jared's spirit, what was, the, what was the goal? The goal was to get over to those folks in chains. Jared's free. He's a free man. His flesh doesn't like it. Flesh doesn't want to go along with it. But Jared makes a decision in his mind. I am going to read the word. I am going to pray. And I am going to go with the gospel, with the good news. Why? Because there are people in bondage. Now listen, it is no longer about you anymore. The reason you need to walk in the spirit, you're already free, is because other people are in bondage for goodness sake. You will, you will not get out of the chair. You will not get out of bed. You will not do anything to advance the cause of Christ if you're doing it for yourself. The reason that you are moved, the reason that you are motivated is when you realize your de deliverance is so great, the mercy is so substantial, that all you can do is, is, is share it, is, is do what you're supposed to do so others are not going to be destined to an eternity in hellfire. And that's not popular preaching today, but that is the truth of God's word. Because it says here that if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. It is not about you. We are so narcissistic. It's about us because Jesus died and he loves us, absolutely. Your salvation is personal, absolutely. But listen, there is a much bigger thing going on and we gotta wake up and realize that Paul says, listen, I gotta, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna choose to walk in the spirit. Not gonna, I'm, not gonna, I'm not even bound by the flesh. Why? Because the spirit of Christ dwells in me. The things that we do, we do because we know there is an adversary who is blinding the minds of them that do not hear our gospel. Their mission was to move forward with the gospel. Satan is actually actively blinding the minds. Well, who is going to get in the way of that? People who get out of bed and get in their Bible. People who walk in wisdom toward those that are without. Man, I think back to my salvation. What if, what if my drafting instructor would have decided, you know, I just don't want to risk my job. I just don't want to cause waves in the school system. You know, I haven't been in the Word this week. These kids are in here talking about the end of times, but eh, I'm not going to say anything. I'll let the kids take care of it. Oh, it's an in... Well, you know what? My employer told me that this is an in-service day, and I'm supposed to be working on something else, so I'm not going to invite that kid over to lead him to Christ. I'm going to honor my employer, which I believe you should do that. But I mean, what if you're not sensitive to what God is doing in the, in the lives of others? People who are blinded. That's why we don't want to walk and allow the flesh to, 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 uh, to dominate us. Because there are people's souls at stake. Keep in mind that the Spirit of God is not just a force. And I love that about this passage in Romans. He is the third person of the Godhead. He is the invisible person of Christ. So, so when Goliath, the Goliath of sin in your life, has you pinned down and the Philistines have your, your territory dominated like they did in Judah. You're having an over, a problem overcoming the giant. The Spirit of God that dwells in you 
is saying, hey, hang on, I can take that giant. <laughs> I, I got it. I've got it. From the time of the fall of Satan, God has been in the business of overcoming devastating effects of sin through the active participation of the Spirit of God. That is why the first time you see the Spirit mentioned in Genesis 1-2, what is he doing? He's moving upon the face of the waters during the regeneration of the earth. Now, for sure, Jesus Christ himself self likens the Spirit of God to the wind in John chapter 3. Uh, and, of course, he has, an, he has an effect on us that is felt uh, and cannot be harnessed and is invisible. But don't miss the fact that Jesus Christ uh, was, was using that as an analogy. There are brothers today, uh, and some of them may not be brothers, that think that the Spirit of God is just some force that we just throw around the room, just some feeling that you get, something that causes you to bust into to, to, uh, uh, an emotional frenzy. And certainly the, the Spirit of God does affect our emotions. And He is like the wind, and He is invisible. But he is also regenerating, and he is also the person, a person of the Godhead, and, and he is able to overcome the law of sin and death, and he is able to walk out his life through yours. So work at the walk, who walk not after the, the flesh, but after the spirit. You know what that implies there? You're going to follow one or the other. Which one are you following? Which one do I want, am I going to follow? You're going to walk after. After means you're behind. I'm following the flesh, or I'm following the Spirit. You know what? That means they're not going the same direction. They're not going the same place. And you know that to be true. I know that to be true. My flesh wants to go this direction and my spirit wants to go this direction. That's what Paul's talking about in Romans 7. So the law of the Spirit versus the law of sin and death. What an incredible thing. This is a great chapter to teach the sufficiency of Christ. It's not talking about your practice, but your position. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 8, check, check this out. Go back to our text. He says, So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Are you pleasing God today? But Look at verse 9. But you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. There are some that believe that the Spirit of God is like in the Old Testament. He comes upon you and then he departs. He comes and he departs. Not the case. When you receive Christ as Lord, the Bible says that your soul is sealed until the day of redemption. It's substantiated in the book of Romans. The reality is that when you get saved, he is in you and you are in him. That's what baptism is all about in Ephesians, the spiritual baptism. 1 Corinthians 12 also speaks about that. So the Spirit of God is in you. You are sealed until the day of redemption. He's with you. You are in the Spirit, and the Spirit is in you. You have no business following the flesh. Why? Because you're more than a conqueror. We're going to look at that later in Romans. And he says, there is therefore now, right now, no condemnation. So, the law of the Spirit versus the law of sin and death. In Romans 8, 2, the Spirit is superior to the law of sin and death, and that's why there's no condemnation. The law of the Spirit Versus the law of Moses. In verses 3 through 6, we see that. And if you go back to the text, Romans 8, 3 through 6, for the law, what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned uh, sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, here it comes, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. That they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity, at war against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed, indeed can be. Jesus says, you know what? If you receive my word, you will be free indeed. Indeed. So the law of the Spirit versus the law of Moses so you give up. You say, that's impossible. You're right. Where you finally die is where Christ, the one who dwells in you, overcomes. And Jesus did in his flesh what, he, what we could never do in our flesh. He put away sin. Romans chapter 9 and verse 26 says that. For then must he often have uh, suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Jesus Christ, his sacrifice is sufficient for all of our sin. 
Jesus was made in the likeness of sinful flesh, but he was not sinful. Therefore, his sacrifice was acceptable for all of our sin. Paul is going to help us out uh, with this uh, in just a moment, but we need, when we get to Romans 8 and verse 13. But in essence, he is not talking about spiritual death here. He's speaking of physical death. To be carnally minded is death. There's a a profound truth in what God is showing us through the Apostle Paul here. To allow the flesh to dominate will literally bring physical death. If you don't receive Christ, you will eternally be condemned to death. You will eat too much sugar, you'll grow fat and get diabetes. You'll become a drunk and pickle your liver. You'll drive too fast, run off the road and flip your car. All those things happen when we let our flesh drive the car. You grow old gracefully, only to find out that you're still buried six feet under and you're pushing up the daisies. Your flesh is all about death, and it must be freed by the Spirit. The law brings forth death because it proves our actions are guilty of death. But the carnal mind versus the spiritual mind, verses 6 through 8, then, uh, changes the game. When you receive Christ, you receive the Spirit of God, and you now have the mind of Christ. You have His Spirit to teach you all things whatsoever He has said unto you. And if we focus on, focus on the earthly flesh, we will reap the results thereof. But Paul told the Corinthians uh, that the believers who chose to live under the law of the flesh will be released from duty prematurely in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 or chapter 11 and verse 30. There are believers even in the church, people who are born again, who say, well, you know what? I'm not going to listen to God, even though I'm, I'm set apart for his use. I'm just going to do whatever my flesh wants. I'm going to follow after it. I'm not going to follow after Christ, even though I've been purchased. And you know what? Paul says, you know what? Some of those folks are sleeping right now because they wanted to test God to see how serious he was. And you know what? They're dead. They're dead. Your flesh is not playing around. It will take you to the grave and short circuit your opportunity to glorify him. And I'm not talking to lost people. I'm talking to saved people. You want to go play around with drugs? You want to go mess around? You want to act like you're lost even though you're saved? You may be six feet under quicker than you want to be. And what do you, well, so what's the deal? You're in heaven. Praise the Lord. Listen, this is the deal. You missed your opportunity to glorify God. The only time you have in in, in eternity to choose to follow after Christ is now. This is the only opportunity you get. After this body's changed, man, you're locked. This is it. This is the only time you get to love God like you get to love him now. Because this is the time you get to choose to follow after the Spirit. You get to magnify who he is. And you get to tell the flesh no. Isn't that a great opportunity? Man, that's a beautiful thing. It's a glorious thing. It's a privilege. The carnal mind versus the spiritual mind. So when you receive Christ, you receive the Spirit of God, and you now have the mind of Christ and His Spirit. So if we focus on the earthly flesh, we'll reap the results, and that will not be good. The fleshly mind will not produce spiritual results. You'll have to have a spiritual mind to get spiritual results. And that's the problem. We try to finish in the the flesh the things that can only be done in the Spirit. And Paul makes that clear, that you know what? His word is what? spirit it's spiritual you need to feed your soul the word of god so that it can be victorious over the desire of the flesh so the unregenerate man cannot please god so i don't want you to be confused go to verse 9 we got to wrap this up verse 9 says but ye are not in the flesh but in the spirit if so be that the spirit of god here it comes dwell in you Are you born again? If you're born again biblically, the Spirit of God does dwell in you. So you are not in the flesh. You are not condemned. You are a new creature in Christ Jesus. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So watch that but in the Bible in verse 9. It's great news. You'd be hopeless. I'd be hopeless without it. The power of the indwelling Spirit in you found uh, several times in these uh, next few verses. If you're not saved according to Romans 8 9, you don't have the Spirit. You either have him or you don't. There is much confusion today over the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Charismatics would have you to believe that there's a second blessing based on their understanding of the book of Acts and the way the Jewish believers received the Spirit of God at Pentecost. But the Bible teaches something completely different as you go on through the transition of the book of Acts and we see that we get saved by grace through faith. And when you accept Christ as Savior, the Spirit of God dwells in you that is your saving faith when you accept christ as as lord and he comes in you it is the invisible person of christ the spirit of god that seals your soul he is in you and you are in him that is the one true baptism and it's a big deal it's what sets you free and makes you free indeed so a few things will a few little things like that 
will leave a well-intentioned person lost or a young believer unstable and misunderstanding the indwelling Spirit of God. And it's imperative that believers understand it's not about getting more of the Holy Ghost, but the Holy Ghost getting more of you. When you get saved, the power resides there. The victor is there. If you're not having victory, if, when I'm not having victory, and we all go there, it's not, it's not God's fault. It's our fault. It's not trying to get more of the Spirit of God. You know what you need to do? I can tell you it's real simple. You need to get more of the Word of God. More of the Word of God. More of the fellowship with God. More focus on God. More worship of God. That's the problem. Romans 8.10 tells us, Because Christ dwells in you, if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. This is great because now we're back to our, our weekend at Bernie's, right? You can now push your flesh around instead of it pushing you around. That's what you saw in the skit. Uh, it wasn't weekend at Bernie's, but it was almost like it. They hooked the arms and said, okay, come on, flesh, where are you going? Get, come on, you're going with me because we got business. I need you, legs. I need you, arms. I know you're hungry. Come on, let's go. I got, I got meat that you know not of. Come on, let's go, right? And you just, and you go, and you, you do, you tell the flesh, no, because the spirit is much stronger because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies. So not only is this going to bring you victory in the practical aspect of your everyday life, which all the Odyssean Christians are looking for, Right? we got to have victory today. But no, no. It goes much further than that. It does. That's what verse 11 is talking about. He says, oh no. And he's getting ready to set us up for the spiritual adoption. You're going to be adopted. You're going to have a transformation. This is great. The promise of the resurrection includes the power of Christ dwelling in you through his spirit. This passage ties nicely to 1 Corinthians 15, which goes into great detail concerning the resurrection. We see the word quicken, and we contrast it to Ephesians 2 and verse 1. Look at this real closely as, we, uh, as we're getting done here. It says, therefore, I'm sorry, verse 11, but if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, if you're born again, then the spirit does dwell in you. He that raised up Christ from the dead, look at this, shall also quicken your mortal bodies but the spirit <clears throat> by his spirit that dwelleth in you now it's very clear in verse 11 that the spirit dwells in you when now that's why there is now no condemnation to them who walk uh, after the spirit right? right because he's in us and we follow him but in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1 some of you guys had that memorized what's it say and you half he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. See, there's two parts of this thing. There's that moment, Ephesians chapter 2, when by, by grace, through faith, you receive Christ, and he hath quickened you. You're already alive, positionally. We're, we're alive. I'm alive right now. I will never die. But it's only partially done. And, and what you see in Romans chapter 8 here, in verse 11, is that we shall also be quickened. So you say, well, that's a contradiction in the Bible. No, it's not. It's a confirmation in the Bible that there is actually victory coming over this carcass. So March 25th, 1987, I said, Christ, come into my heart. Save me. Forgive me of my sin. However, I said that prayer. I turned my life over to Christ. I trusted him as Savior. I was changed in an instant. I was quickened. I'm alive. But you know what? I still got this dead carcass. It thinks it's alive, but it's dead. And so I got a promise in Romans, and it says, listen, Brian, you're okay. I know you're battling like Romans chapter 7, and I know there's a struggle, but listen, you shall be quickened. What's happened on the inside is going to be transferred to the outside, and it's just a matter of time. And you know what that does? That breeds in us hope. And it lets us understand that this is only for a season. That's why Paul calls it a race. What is a race? Is a race strenuous? Absolutely. There is a struggle. There is a conflict. There is a, a war. And so you run that race and you finish your course. Why? Because you are promised that you will be quickened on the outside just like you have been on the inside. And that's why you feed your spirit. This is, a glo this is glorious because not only is your flesh dead, but the spirit of God has power to change and resurrect your mortal body. 
And so we sit here and we lament our flesh and we think, man, our flesh stinks and man, I want to kill the flesh. Hey, it's coming. And so we don't even fear death anymore because we know as we look at death's door, as we look at death's door, all it is is opportunity for our bodies to be transformed. And it may take a few years before they come out of the grave, but do you rest assured we have victory over the grave. We have victory over this old body. We will be changed. 1 Corinthians 15 says so. In verse 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trump shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible in Christ. The reason many people see no change in their lives is because they have never been changed on the inside. I'm excited about this, guys. I can't, I don't know who's saved. I know I am. And when you're saved, you have something to look forward to. Your flesh does stink. It's not your friend. It never will be good to you. But you know what? It's already been overcome. So don't waste all your time being a servant to it. Serve Christ. You don't owe your flesh anything. Look at verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh... For if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify, do kill. Morticians, they put people under, right? If we mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. You tell your body, no, you are a dead man. You know what you're going to experience? Even as your, your soul is surrounded by death, you're going to see a life. You're going to be a walking paradox. No condemnation, no confusion. And no questions. Choose this day whom you will serve. You know the sons of God by their fruit. In Matthew chapter 7, people always go there. Judge not lest you be judged. Do you know what it also says? There's going to be many false prophets. By their fruits you shall know them. It's the fruit of the Spirit. Are you saved this morning? Is the Spirit of God dwelling in you? Hey, if so, there is now, 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 no condemnation. You say, but Brian, but Brian what? There is now no, well, you see, I I don't care about you. You're dead. You say, but I know you, no, I know you did, but Jesus died for that. You say, but you don't, no, I don't have to understand because Jesus already took care of it. So give me more excuses. Why are we not walking in the Spirit if you're truly born again? Why are you not walking after the Spirit? Why are you not following God with your whole heart? Well, I'll tell you why. Your mind has been corrupted from the simplicity that's in Christ. That's what it is. And you know what? We all wrestle with that. I've been saved for a quarter of a century, guys. And I'm telling you, it doesn't get any easier. I don't want to discourage anybody. But I'm telling you guys, if you want to see fruit, and fruit that remains, it comes right here. Right here. And not allowing yourself to be deceived, not making friends with your flesh, but walking in the Spirit. Understanding that you are already forgiven. There hath no condemnation. There is no condemnation. So don't serve your flesh. You don't owe it anything. Serve the one who bought you. Serve the one who has power. Serve the one who brings life. Serve the one who's going to change your body. Serve the one who loves you. Don't serve death. Why would you do that? Man, guys, there's a day coming at the judgment seat of Christ. It's all going to come down. The things that we've done in the body, whether they be good or bad. And we're all, it's all going to set in on us that there's no condemnation. Why didn't we follow the Spirit? I'll tell you why. Because we didn't love Him. If you love Him, you keep His commandments. You have been set free. You are free indeed. So live like it. Give Him your your all. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. You've been forgiven. So forgive others. Right? Right? You've already been forgiven. 
So why won't you forgive others? Why do you let that stuff hold you down? Why? Because your flesh loves it. Tell your flesh no. Renew your mind. Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. Because you know what? You are resurrected. You're as good as in eternity, positionally. It's just a matter of time if you're born again. So what is holding you back? What is it? What is that sin that does so easily beset you? Would you just lay that aside? Well, Brian, but no. If you're born again, would you just lay that aside and run with patience the race that is set before you so that God can be glorified in the time you have remaining? Not because I asked you, not because it's good for you. It may be painful for you, but would you do that for his sake? Because I promise you, you will have peace. There, I missed that passage. There's peace that comes with that. A peace that you'll never find in this life. A peace that you'll never find in this earth. A peace that you'll never find in the flesh. Follow him. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to come together. We look forward to next week as we look further into this.